data. And of course, we want to make sure that we are ready because there are other things that come uh, in winter. Of course, we're preparing for flu as a, as a good example of that. And of course, as we're all concerned about nationally and locally, we want to be able to respond if there is uh, an increase in COVID-19 related disease locally to us or, or, or nationally as we saw at the beginning. Of course, uh, I've mentioned we've we've transformed, we've been using transformation of services to respond and we really want to keep those where they're of benefit. But also this has been a challenging time for our health and care staff and we need to make sure that we uh, we look after them. They've been working incredibly hard over the months before. They work hard normally, but we've 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 clearly uh, that we've had a different burden on on our teams, and so we need to make sure they they're fully supported and, and refreshed and ready to um, to face the, the the winter challenges. But also, we've seen some inequalities come through in terms of staff. We I mentioned earlier uh, the. BAME community that that is also reflected in our staff and our, some of our occupations in the health and care system have been more impacted than others and we need to be uh, supportive of those. In terms of the overall response to the emergency, um, you may or may not be aware that there is something called the Local Resilience Forum that oversees this whole response and that includes partners such as the police, the fire service, local governments um, you know and, and, and others uh, to make sure that we're all helping to respond and that is chaired by the chief constable for Derbyshire uh, Rachel Swan and, and, and the health and social care system that I'm part of supports that approach and obviously um, it, it plays an important part but not the only part in, in this and of course you'll remember um, from a, a month or two ago the help us help you campaign that says look uh, we're getting our services back up and running. Help us to help you get back into those and, and we continue in, in, in that approach. So some of the things that we've seen really positively come through in this response to the crisis, we've seen that the mental health helpline, as I say, really good uptake, really important that we, we, we stay mentally fit and well during these challenging times. I've seen general practice really change its approach uh, you know, really, there's a few examples there about how general practice has altered. It's uh, which is incredible uh, change to the challenge. We're we're triaging. We're 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 looking much more about the care requirements of, of patients before we send them through to different services. We're seeing patients in different ways, and we're really looking at vulnerable groups such as as care homes, particularly. And of course, though, um, many of the changes we've 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 made have had to be made in, in that urgent way. And, and in that basis, there are they are temporary. In many places, though, they uh, the, the virus made us accelerate and, and go faster on things that we were already planning to do. As, as you've seen, all of those things on the other side were intentions of, of the NHS and care system. And then but we do have to remember our, our duties. So when changes to services involve uh, the changes of location of services or or the way that people access them, we need to do a higher level of, of, of discussion. And depending on the change uh, in front, if we were going to make those permanent, there would continue to be a, a requirement to inform, involve or consult with the public, depending on the, the nature of the change. Uh, in an emergency, the NHS is, is able to make those changes, but we do that in, in the best interest uh, of protecting the health of the public in, in doing so. But we would always want to, to, to come back to those and talk about them. Um, of course, though, we've, we've done our best to continue our public involvement and, uh, um, you know, even in those emergency changes, we want to keep talking, we want to talk through and, and we've got lots of examples where our healthcare trusts have been involving patients and uh, in those those changes as that, that have either been paused or we're, we're restoring about how we do that. And again, as I say, although these temporary changes uh, you know, we may want to keep them. They'll be subject to more formal mechanisms, depending if we want to make those permanent. And please, please watch this space 
for those sorts of conversations as, as we go forward. Um, really important to us before um, the pandemic struck, really, we were we were really working as a joined up care Derbyshire system on our on our approach to engagement. We'd set up the engagement committee and, and we get great support from from the public on those and and we've tried we've, we've got that back up and running because we want to think about how, how we have conversations um we've really wanted to think about uh, this this restoration recovery phase and how do we make sure that we're engaging on on those important things and we've certainly included a really robust um quality assurance about those those changes and we want to be talking about those so when you're thinking about longer term planning, because there's lots for us to consider, you've got to ask yourself questions. And I've just got some of the key questions that we're we're considering now. Um, we're, we're clearly they're not just hanging questions. We're working on them, but these are the sorts of things that we're thinking about, which I hope you'll find helpful and 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 will make sense. But obviously, you know what 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 do we think the pandemic has done with regards to mental ill health? Um, what do we think the consequences? Uh, to, uh, in terms of mental well-being have been so clearly in, in a pandemic you think of the obvious physical health the respiratory disease but we're human beings and and, and uh, you know we've got an emotional side to us and, and what's been the the response and what's happened as regards to mental uh, well-being in, in in regard to the, the pandemic well obviously we, we were concerned about um, the halving of, of accident emergency attenders and where have they gone and, and where are they receiving care? And, and that's a, an important question for us. And, and as we work forward, do, do all of those previous attenders need to come back or, or, or only a pro proportion of them? And again, similarly, we've seen a significant change. I mentioned it earlier in terms of the ambulance service uh, undertaking assessments at, at the scenes of, 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 of um, of, of of the sort of cases that occur in the ambulance service and and doing what's more here and treat so treating over the phone or or seeing treats or treating at the scene as opposed to taking those patients to other settings like hospitals accident emergency departments and so on and and i've mentioned how do we lock in the the positive benefits and i suppose you know thinking about the last few points i was making around long waiting times what will be the impact of those longer waiting times and how do we start to both improve them but understand what those are and make provision for them and a really big important matter that, that we've been um, considering and working on and engaging on is how do we increase confidence in accessing health services in, in, in this pandemic we're still in the panic so and if we if we all agree that we want to get those other cases coming back not just the covid cases but other cases how do we build confidence in the and 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 the work that our hospitals, for example, are doing to keep keep our patients COVID safe. So just just coming to a, sort of the last couple of slides, Chair, if I may. Um, uh, this is the start, and of course, um, we're all getting used to the technology. We're all getting used to the, the nature of how we do this. Uh, we've got three, uh, three uh, further sessions planned. Uh, the next session uh, is on the 7th of October and we're thinking about that last point I was making around uh, mental health and well-being and um, how do we think about um, the the needs from a mental health perspective. So that's the sort of framing for the next conversation, but obviously what we talk about today may then uh, influence that. And then we've got another two further sessions planned. Uh, we, we need to just work on the, the dates, but Again, this this session today may throw up many questions and we can we can probably build build those in and factor those in depending on on what participants want to talk about. Um, we hope that you'll share this information with the groups that, that you're involved in um, for, for sure. That's the whole point and, and the sort of key messages that we we'd hope that um, general practice particularly is open. It's working differently, as I've said, it's working differently, but it is open. Uh, and uh, is, is there to deal with health needs. Um, uh, you know, we wouldn't want patients at home really concerned about their health and not not accessing advice and support. And again, 111 has played a really key part in COVID-19 uh, response and will continue to do so. And again, really, really important, if, you know, and I'm not the first to say this, and one of our 
GP Lit Cancer leaders has, has, has been talking to members of the public about, look, if, if you've got concern that you might have something seriously wrong, let, let's get help because because we can make it safe uh, to attend appointments. Let's let let's um, let's really understand, you know, those concerns and help them. And, and I'll stop there, Chair, if that's OK, and, and obviously come to questions and feedback. What I'll do is, if it's OK, I'll take this down from the screen so that uh, it doesn't dominate uh, uh, the screen, if that's OK. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chris. Um, thank you very much um, for that. Uh, I hope everybody could could hear and, and, and get access to that OK and, and see the presentation. Um, so we've already got a few questions. Um, as I say, I'm going to try and get to them, but I might need a little bit of help um, with it because it's difficult to do see them at the same time. We had a query um, from Victoria about uh, some of the percentages with the Black, Asian, minority, ethnic um, cohort of patients that we have, which I think Sean is going to address. Um, we've had another uh, query on the chat box from David with regard to um, the ability to and the difficulty of booking online blood tests and online booking um, generally and, and weights around the Ripley area. Um, so if we start with that one, Bridget, do you want to give us a, a little update on that? Sorry. All right, I know, Sorry, you're on, I know you're on muting, don't worry, I know you're on muting. <laughs> <laughs> it just wasn't working quite the way I wanted it. Good morning, everybody. Um, as we said earlier, I'm Bridget Stacey, I'm Chief Nurse, BCG. Um, we, we have had um, issues around at the beginning around um, people not actually wanting to come to GP practices and obviously having to put COVID safe um, GP appointments in whilst we move to virtual. We haven't had any feedback around there being any issues currently. In turn, in certainly primary care are reporting to us that um, they're, they're coming back up to pre-COVID levels. While some of that is still um, virtual, they are seeing that increase in activity, which at the beginning in, in April, March and April, we were seeing a decrease in that. So we haven't had any um, concerns about any delays in getting blood a blood tests or appointments with GPs, but we'll certainly pick that up, Sean. If we can pick that up, particularly in the Ripley area, um, and, and we'll come back to, to, to folk on those. Thank you, um, Bridget. Um, just moving on, uh, we've got a question from Jane with regard to face-to-face -face GP appointments being recognised as being continually important. I'll probably take that one myself being a GP. Um, absolutely, they are. Um, I believe at the beginning of this, it was a challenge for general practice because it was ever changing literally by the day about how we would manage patients. I know in my practice, we were having daily meetings as the um, information from central government and central NHS altered um, with the move towards more remote consultation, be that either via a uh, phone link or, or video link. Um, as time goes on, I think we are seeing that the balance is probably somewhere in between and that face to face appointments still are imperative. Um, we in our practice, and I know many of the practices around Derbyshire operate a mix of uh, remote consultations and face to face appointments. I think the main difference is the face to face ones are mainly there when they are needed as opposed to when a discussion can take place over the phone or via a video link. Now, I do know that some patients would rather come and speak to their GP face to face. And I also know for a fact that many GPs would rather see their patients face to face because sometimes in some methods of remote consulting, it can be less efficient than face to face. But we also have to have an eye on the safety aspect, both for the patients, other people in the surgery and, and the staff. But I can definitely say that face to face is important. And I think most practices we go along are now looking at the level of face to face versus um, virtual appointments that they're offering. So I hope that gives some answer towards that one. Um, then we have a, a query from, uh, I think, Peter, with regard to some inconsistencies 
about how different GP practices have approached the COVID situation. And I'm assuming that is in keeping with different practices offering different things. Um, again, I'll start and I'll, I'll, I'll hand that over to Bridget in a second. Um, I think the answer, the, the first part of the answer to that is the same as the answer to the last question, which is it was an exceptional challenge at the beginning. And I know there was a cross section from some practices, not just in Derbyshire, but around the whole country, shutting their doors completely to operating very much how they were before. And I don't think we had a levelling out. We have had some standard operating procedures from NHS England in terms of how we should operate. And they are still in keeping with everything being remote initially. We are working very closely with the practices through the CCG and what's called the primary care networks, the PCNs, which are groups of practices that work together and have GP leads who then will speak to other GPs and practices around the area to try and maintain that consistency of approach and level that out. But as with everything, there is always going to be a slight variation as there was before. Um, Bridget, do you want to comment on that as well? Thanks, Chair. Certainly. I mean, um, Abby, I think you've covered most of the points regarding that. But in addition to that, um, we have um, we have membership forums for all of the GP practices on a weekly basis where COVID is a very real factor in, in how we address some of these issues and some of the standing operating procedures have been sent out via that forum. We also have a, a GP practice newsletter which goes out, talks about all the national guidance and changes um, and, and some of the, the requirements that we would ask our GP practices to do. And then finally, we have um, a, a system escalation group uh, which meets three times a week where we have the GP Alliance um, membership there where we get information around um, different approaches to COVID, all, all being uh, adopted through, through one way, whether it's provider or um, GP practices. So for example, um, issues around infection prevention and control all go through that. So those are three areas that we try to ensure consistency. We also have a um, incident room that GP practices can contact if they've got any queries or concerns uh, regarding any of the procedures or anything to do with COVID, that we will respond to them. Thanks, Bridget. Um, I'm just looking up and down the questions. Um, there's a few questions from David, and then I'm going to come to Stephen's question after and try and work through them. The questions from David are around uh, three facets. Uh, in Derbyshire, will there be post-COVID-19 clinics for any individuals who need extra support? A question about flu jabs um, and how they're being addressed and access to that. And then a third question with regard to um, patients potentially having to wait outside a practice when the sun isn't shining and it's a little bit colder. Um, I I'll take the latter two swiftly and then perhaps I'll hand over to Bridget. Um, one is with regard to... Um, in, in terms of the flu, the flu that, that has already started. There's been quite a lot of work with regard to uh, what we call a flu cell, which again is the CCG working with the primary care networks to get flu clinics up and running in an efficient way, bearing in mind the issues we have around COVID and access to surgeries. Um, the, I think our flu clinics in each surgery have probably already started. I know ours started today. Uh, there are going to be various at-risk groups that we need to address. We expect the take up of the flu jab this year is going to be higher than in previous years. And we're also going to be offering the immunization to a larger cohort of patients than we were previously. So this is a challenge. However, a lot of work has gone into this. A lot of work has gone into this at an early stage. So not only will GP practices be offering the flu jab and pharmacists as before, but we're looking at wider healthcare professionals being able to offer it going forward, for example, community nurses so patients when they access somebody from the NHS are going to get access to that jab um, in terms of standing outside in the cold I, I think it is a challenge and we hope that patients do not have to stand outside surgeries because the surgery hopefully will be able to try and manage that as best as possible in terms of when they ask the patient to come down 
but some surgeries are restricted by the social distancing issues in the waiting room. So that will be down to the individual surgery. I hope some of the PPG groups can put that into place. And that's certainly something that Bridget and I will feed back down to the PCNs to be followed up. Um, Bridget, do you want, there was also a comment about dry air cleaning from David. Bridget, do you want to follow anything up there? Um, I'm not sure about the dry air clinic, David, so we'll come back to you on that. But certainly um, the issue about COVID-19 support clinics um, for patients post-COVID, um, there are lots of uh, research going on at the moment around what are the post-COVID effects for people and for the community. And that's something that uh, in conjunction with our mental health trust, we'll be looking at through the planning um, cell that, that we have in the, in the system um, to look at that. But also there was a question earlier on, or I think a little bit later about the mental health um, helpline continuing. Yes, the plan is that that will continue um, post COVID. Uh, so, so some of those concerns can be addressed through that. But um, we will feed into the planning cell the issue of post-COVID rehab clinics. Thank you. Um, there's a, there's a, a question from um, Stephen. Um, Stephen, could, could I ask you to ask that question? Because I, I don't fully understand it from, from what you've written. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. It's all right. What, what, what I'm saying is, for, for a number of years now, we've been... Um, looking at a and &E attendance with regard to a number of people attending unnecessarily that there are other options that they could have chosen and how that can be reduced now covid has brought about a natural break to a and &E attendance so is it not a waste of time looking at well why are these people not attending but rather let it take its own natural course and the ones who need to attend will continue to attend, but the ones who have been attending for very minor things that could have probably been dealt with with a pharmacy or whatever, could that not be left to take its nat natural progression? Um, I, I, I'll, I'll probably take that one and bring in Bridget and Chris if, if they want to. I, I, it's a very valid point. By the way, I'm very impressed with the way you unmuted yourself and got on straight away there. That was very impressive. Um, so uh, I, I think what we saw was less use of A&E, obviously. What we're now beginning to see is A&E going back up to it, its previous levels of usage, which, which is going to be a challenge. I think one of our concerns is, and this is anecdotal and with some evidence base, is that sometimes the usage of A&E in the increased levels is not from the most appropriate area. Um, and some of the patients, I've seen this in my surgery myself, who have had things that they really need to go to A&E for have said, I'm not going because I have concerns about COVID. Um, so I, I get what you're saying and, and I wished it were true, um, but I think we probably do need to keep getting that message out there, which is patients having the right service, right time, right place by the right person. But I, I do get you what you're saying. Anything further to add, Chris or Bridget, on that one? Yeah, I mean, if I can, I think I think the point is 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 really valid, uh, and um, I think we want to restore the services that that we need to see and and the care that we need to see in the right place and the right time, as you've set out. I, um, you're absolutely right. Pre-COVID, we talked around, didn't we, using accident emergency departments for accidents and emergencies uh, to go to really simple language, uh, and we want to make sure that's the case. I think I think. Um, just scanning through the chat box, uh, I think um, uh, another participant said, look, well, some of this care has gone into other places, it hasn't just disappeared, it's gone into other places, you know, pharmacies and um, other 111 and other places. So, so we've seen that to a degree. I think my biggest concern is making sure that we haven't got patients with really serious conditions, life-threatening, urgent conditions, sat at home, not coming forward. We need to get those back in. I think I think you're I, I will watch with with interest and obviously continue to to plan uh, on this basis. But but what the what the level is uh, in, in, you know, in the next six to 12 months, uh, what we see uh, emerging in terms of access to different types of services, uh, I think it's a really important point. Uh, my biggest driver, as, a, as I said, though, is making sure that the right cases come through and that we don't have um, 
patients sat at home suffering when 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 they they've got a definite need but it, uh, thanks Avi and, and thanks Stephen I think it's a really important point. Avi can I just, uh, just please, add something please, please. there yeah yeah um, this is a really good example of um, trying to build on uh, some of the good things that happened through through Covid and um, because folk are right people did access services elsewhere and the use of 111 was much higher and this has resulted in uh, a pilot which is happening nationally um, called Triage First or 111. It's got different names and it's going to be, well, once it's rolled out, it's going to encourage people to contact 111 for assessment or, or other services where they can get an assessment before going to A&E. And I think what's happened is COVID may make people much more um, encourage people much more to access those services so uh, I'm hopeful over the coming months that we'll see a more appropriate use um, of, of A&E but uh, as Chris says it's really important that people have the care at the right time and the right place. Um, Chair I think it was the question from Julie Lowe next on the long-term effects of Covid was actually the question from Claire on when the mental health oh, line continues, um, and, and, and then and then we'll move down. Um, so we've got a question on will the mental health line continue, um, Bridget? Yes, yeah, that that was the question I picked up earlier in the answer. It's going to continue for the foreseeable future. Thank you. And then to Julie's question on the long term, a little bit building on what we've mentioned before, the long term effects of COVID on the population and the potential need for rehab. Um, what 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 are the CCG planning, Bridget, Chris? So, Help me to take that one, Bridget. You you can take it then if you want, Chris. Just, I mean, just I mean, I think I think I think it's a really important question um, that um, clearly we we we've been dealing with the the immediate effects of of COVID, and I said right at the beginning, making sure that we had the right care facilities to deal with uh, what is you know in principle a respiratory disease. Um, but the, the, the question is really important. It's a new virus. Um, we're obviously observing the longer term effects. Uh, just to give some context, uh, Steve Lloyd, Dr. Steve Lloyd, who's the CCG's medical director, is is helping support the the Joint Care Derbyshire system in looking at what um, what we know about the long term effects from the the national evidence that's emerging. Um, the updates we get from Public Health England and, and, and starting to think as a system as what are the longer term effects that we, we need to think about and plan for. So I think it's a I think it's an important question We're we're understanding this in real time as we all are, uh, but it's not lost on us in terms of those longer term effects. And I think um, things like rehabilitation it, uh, just you know going to be a fundamental part and, and we're going to need to plan for. Um, so um, I think I think that's all I'd, I'd want to say at, at this moment. Avi. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to keep scrolling down this. Please don't shoot me if I miss a question because it is it, it's quite a challenge um, getting all these, these these questions and not missing any out. Um, flu jabs. Will unpaid carers be remembered from Sally? Uh, yes. Uh, a lot of work is is, is going into um, uh, flu jabs and also flu jabs for carers particularly for carers for shielded patients as well, uh, as I alluded to with, with the wider cohort of people being um, offered the immunisation. So I hope that will be the case, definitely. Um, moving down, um, a question from um, uh, Amo. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and I think a very relevant one as well. Um, so noting a lot of people with, uh, with conditions and long term conditions, we're mentioning MS, Parkinson's, etc who are waiting for routine appointments with consultants that may be delayed um, and therefore there's some deterioration potentially in their primary condition and also about stress and mental health levels which I think we're all seeing both in our in, in our lives and, and at work um, and, and what are the plans generally to, to deal with this in terms of the, the restoration. Uh, Chris, Bridget. So, so if I start off with that and um, just to give some feedback all of the um, patients who are waiting for outpatient appointments in all of our providers are using an, a national risk stratification tool to look at who is the most clinically urgent, both from a clinical 
deterioration in their condition, um, but also uh, to do with um, have they other, any other risk factors, picking up on an earlier question about BAME um, patients as well, and also any additional concerns that they have about mental stress and, and mental health. So that is being addressed through a national risk stratification tool, which we are working with our providers to make sure that they apply and um, deliver on that. Thanks. Chris, anything to add? Uh, nothing just to reiterate I think I think thanks Bridget I think you've asked answered Victoria's question there around um, at risk factors COVID and non-COVID as well and what we're trying to do to risk stratify thanks Bridget. Thanks um, a question from from John um, certainly around the wider determinants a very relevant question uh, what more can be done to encourage and support the public to exercise more um, in order to improve an individual's ability to cope with COVID as well as their general physical and mental health uh, what is the information being given to healthcare professionals? Um, Chris, you've done quite a lot of work on the wider determinants, haven't you? Yeah, I, 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 again, I mean, I, I can't fault any of the questions at all because, the, the, I mean, this, uh, you know, obviously in the pandemic, um, one of the uh, early things, uh, one of the early messages was clearly about reducing infection and re reducing spread and therefore going out by definition less. But what do we know? We We know that one of our, key drivers of, of, of good health is, is, is exercise and activity. And so we're going to have to um, come back to uh, these key drivers, these key determinants of, of, of ill and, and, and how to achieve good health. I th I'm just trying to think um, uh, for future sessions and I'm, I'm, uh, whether it would be helpful uh, to bring uh, one of our public health colleagues who works in the system on to start to help us think about some of these wider determinants and, um, and 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 help this conversation. I think um, I don't know. I'll just ask you, Chair, at the end to see whether and, and work with Sean as to whether it'd be really helpful to get some public health colleagues on as well. Yeah. Uh, because some um, broader questions than uh, the the more straightforward health and social care services. Um, I think the question's right. We are picking it up um, as as members on the call know. Um, the key determinants of health uh, remain. So reduced uh, tobacco consumption, reduced uh, smoking, diet, exercise, those all remain really important factors that affect Derbyshire and the, and the overall health of Derbyshire. So they remain really important things to, for us to focus on. And, and certainly I, I, I'm committing to working on uh, those, what we call wider determinants of, of, of health with our public health colleagues in the system. Thanks very much. Uh, there was a query about the standard operating procedure for general practice. I'm sure Bridget can can pick that up afterwards. Um, we've then got a, a query from uh, Patricia with regard to a potential COVID vaccine and, and how that would be sort of managed. Um, Bridget, do you want to, um, to comment on that, please? Yes, certainly. So um, we're in the process, as, as the chair mentioned earlier, so we're okay. planning I'm so sorry. Sorry, uh, Abby, can you repeat that question? The question is around uh, a potential vaccine for COVID um, if and when one comes about and how we would then manage uh, the immunisation regime for that. Bridget. OK, thank you, Chair. So as the Chair mentioned earlier, we are used to having mass immunisation vaccines for the flu and we have very robust flu plans in place. This year we are adding a uh, the plans for operationalising the vaccine uh, for COVID to, to work alongside the flu. So we'd, we would adopt the same principles but we, we've got planning cell, COVID planning cell at the moment um, that is looking to uh, develop operational plans as to how we would administer the vaccine, the COVID vaccine across the system and once it becomes available. So uh, once we have a vaccine, we, we should be ready to go with that. Thank you. Um, there's a question, question from uh, Re Rebecca um, with regard to surgeries, including their social prescribers and their post-COVID response. I mean, I'll take that one, absolutely. And I would hope they would already be doing so 
and have been doing so over the COVID pandemic. So that wouldn't be a new thing, but that would be um, something that would be had been going on all along and will continue to go on. Um, and I'm happy to discuss that further after. Um, so just going down, um, I'm trying to just go down one. There's another query around A and E. I think I think we've got that one. I, I totally agree um, with actually trying to get patients to the right place at the right time. Uh, there's a question from Fiona uh, with regard. So um, with regard to a child minding service with with four staff staff members, um, will there be any support to vaccinate the staff with the flu vaccine? Um, Bridget, do you want to take that one? Yes, certainly. So. Um, once we have um, the, the, the vaccine is available, in the same way that um, the flu vaccine has certain criteria and risk groups um, who will be vaccinated first, then um, we will have the same principles for the COVID vaccine. So there will be a national stance around who, um, who is eligible for, for the COVID vaccine and at what stage, and we will follow that national guidance. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you for the helpful comments around uh, the ability to get a private vaccine if needed, um, although we would hope to be able to try and get the, 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 the one out to as many people as possible. I, I think, and you can all shoot me if I haven't, that I've got most of those questions. Just stick them on again, because we've got a couple of minutes if I haven't. Um, Pete's comment, I, I, I can't agree more. Um, it, it, uh, it, it's a two way street um, with, with, with all of this. Um, and it, it's about getting that message, message out there simply and consistently and, and enabling the public as much as they can to be able to do that. The, the, the holy grail of everything is, is, as we've always said, to get to the, 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 the patient to the right place, to see the right person at the right time. Um, and, and also have an element of self-care at the beginning of that. Um, but it, it, it's challenging and increasingly challenging over the COVID um, situation because understandably there was a, a higher degree of anxiety amongst patients. But I couldn't agree more. Um, there's a, a comment from... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, 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 and I think that's where the health and social care aspects come in. I mean, we, we, we know well, there's lots of evidence, and I'm sure many people on this call know that the, the things that the NHS does probably only have about a 20 to 25 percent effect on somebody's health and well-being. And it's all of the wider determinants, um, diet, exercise, lifestyle, where they live, job, et cetera, et cetera, that can have that huge effect. And that's the other challenge is how we can meld those two together and, and be able to affect one another. Um, OK, so I think I've got all the questions. Thank you, everybody, so, so much for the questions, which are all really pertinent and relevant, and also for just the way we've managed to do this. Um, and it was going to be a real challenge, potentially, on a virtual call. I think the questions have worked really well. Everybody's worked with, with the timings available as well. Um, we, we will continue this dialogue. We will set up further ones. As Chris has said, we will bring in other members of, of the team to, um, to, to help out if needs be. Public health was mentioned. And we'll also collate all these questions so we can take them further forward to see if there are any recurring themes or any potential presentations that we may want to do at the beginning of a session going forward. Um, I'll take that last question from Paul, and then I'm going to close the meeting. Um, sorry, not Paul, Pete. Sorry, 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 I haven't got my glasses on. Um, do we anticipate any immediate changes following the proposed launch of the National Institute for Health Protection? Uh, Chris. I, 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 think, um, I think the immediate answer to the immediate question is, is no. Um, obviously, we, we continue to await exact clarification around what, what that change is going to be, but from, from a from a local perspective, we're, we're working solidly across the system in terms of health protection, linking with Public Health England as it currently is uh, set out. And, and we'll watch uh, those changes and obviously um, take the positive benefits out for the local citizens of Derby and Derbyshire. So um, I, I'm not expecting immediate changes, but um, like you, 
uh, I'll be looking at the, the detail of those proposals as they become um, more clear to us. Thanks, Chris. Um, thanks, everybody. Thanks for your really positive comments in, in the chat box as well with how we tried to conduct the meeting. So thanks for the, to, to Sean and his team, but for a lot of the organisation that went around that. And, and, and obviously, thanks to you all for coming and taking the time out of your days. Um, and, and thanks, Chris, Bridget, et cetera. Um, I'm going to say goodbye now. Um, I apologise for not wearing my glasses. Um, um, and if I really apologise if I have missed a question out. We will get back to you afterwards. And hopefully, um, see you all soon at future dates. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Cheers.